Today, somewhere on Earth is going to drop anchor in Jamaica, the third largest island of the Antilles, a land of majestic, tormented landscapes. In the north, there's more than 200 kilometers of coast open to the Caribbean rollers and the trade winds. The Jamaican mountains harbor an unspoiled world steeped in the strains of reggae music. Adam is a real powerhouse. He draws his energy from the most remote corners of the island. A veteran caver and tireless hiker, Adam likes nothing more than exploring the surprising treasures of his island. Howard, the river Rasta, lives in the Blue Mountains. Fisherman, farmer, and singer, he invites us into his world, a realm of dusky forests and bright mornings. Nakley came to Jamaica about 10 years ago. Born in Lebanon in the Middle East, he couldn't imagine his life without the sea nearby. From his war-torn homeland, he brought to Jamaica his passion for free diving. Being in the water, it reflect to me a little bit Mother Nature. Just being in this liquid that holds you, like, like, like a mother will hold, hold you and have the, her arms around you. So uh, it's, it's, it's an experience that, uh, that to me, um, I cannot live without. Jamaica is one of the largest islands of the Caribbean. Christopher Columbus landed on these idyllic shores in 1492. He discovered a wonderful island inhabited by natives, the Tainos. Jamaica, in the middle of the Caribbean Sea, was an ideal port of call for European navigators. This is a land of impenetrable valleys and mountains that reach to the sky. In the Taino language, Jamaica means land of wood and water. The island, furrowed by countless streams and rivers, is hidden by a dense, humid layer of vegetation. Far from the beaches swarming with tourists, we discover another Jamaica, mysterious and unexpected. Sometimes man and nature are perfectly in tune. Adam got up in the middle of the night. He has a five-hour hike ahead of him and is aiming to reach the roof of Jamaica before dawn. Adam's in luck this morning. He's been doing this ascent to the island's summit at over 2,200 meters for more than 20 years. Adam can feast his eyes on the most breathtaking spectacle Jamaica has to offer. It's magical, especially when you come up at night and you don't see the forest. You know, you're just, you're just focusing on the trail. And then when the sun comes up as it, as it is now and the forest comes alive, it's, it's a special place, it's a special place. As Jamaica awakens, it's a call to adventure. Adam, alone on his mountaintop, can savor the light and sounds that drift up from the forest.
up here. You know, you feel that you can do anything. You can accomplish all. You know, when your head clears and uh, you start to make sense of why you're here, you know, your, your purpose here. I'm a son of the soil, you know. <clears throat> it gets into your spirit. You know, whether you're, you're up here in the mountains or underground in a cave or, or at the beach, I mean, the, the, the spirituality is, I think, all around. You just need to listen, you know, and you'll, you'll pick it up. Yes. It was in these mysterious landscapes, where sky, sea, and mountain confront each other, that the myth of the Pirates of the Caribbean was born. In the 16th century, seafarers from the Old World landed on this tropical paradise that sometimes lapsed into a hell on Earth. The coastline and waters off Jamaica are the theater of murderous boardings and bloody battles. Piracy rules the region. Hundreds of Spanish, English, French, and Dutch ships sail the warm waters of the Caribbean, their holds bursting with precious cargo and treasure. Pirates, freebooters, and buccaneers set up their headquarters in Jamaica. The island becomes a hotbed of piracy. The new world colonies of Spain are nearby, and Jamaica is on the route of the warships and trading ships that sail these seas. Pirates like Blackbeard and the bloodthirsty Captain Morgan, the most famous of them all, were the masters of Jamaica. Morgan became a privateer, then was appointed governor. The island would make him a very rich man. Jamaica in the heart of the Caribbean was an ideal base a pirate's lair operating under the skull and crossbones. Adam was born of a Canadian mother and Jamaican father, an artist inspired by the natural force and riches of the island. Adam has strong memories of his childhood where nature played such an important role. This nature that has shaped Jamaican culture into an authentic way of life and thinking. Our culture is very, very vibrant, very expressive. Um, you know, the people like to live as one with, with nature. So it's a, it's a very special place, it's a very magical place, you know, the, the, the energy here, not only in the environment, but in the people, very strong, very powerful. And that makes us Jamaicans. Adam is going to meet up with his friend Wayne in the thick of this dense vegetation.
Wayne is taking part in a study organized by American scientists on the king of the forest, the Jamaican yellow boa, an endemic species. Many times I've dreamt about it at night as a little boy, wanting to explore the forest like the early adventurers. A number of boas were fitted with miniature radio transmitters, and Wayne has to localize them in order to study their movements, their habitat, and their hunting grounds. When it comes to homing in on the invisible king of the forest, no one is better than Wayne. If I turn it this way, I don't get any signal at all. In this direction, I get a signal, but it's pretty weak. So the snake is not down there. It must be higher up. It's pretty close. Could be anywhere, also. Yeah, it could be anywhere. Hey! I see him. He's stretching out. He's moving now. I can see him breathing. Yeah, you see him over there? You can see the little eyes. This is it, I've thought it could. Yeah. So how many times have you found her? I found her several times, but it's been about two months now since I've seen any boas at all. With all this data collected, they'll learn more about the territoriality of the Jamaican yellow boa, and so be able to protect it. This boa doesn't need a vast amount of space to hunt, feed and reproduce, but still, we have to grant this endangered species the place it deserves in the forest. Adam is going to plunge even deeper into the heart of his island beyond the last roads and villages. Cockpit country is a world apart, secret, nearly inaccessible. There are thousands of caves here, most of them yet to be explored. Here, we're just on the periphery of the cockpit country, entering it now. I mean, if you look, you can see the conical hill starting, the big limestone masses, this is the beginning of it, of the, the, the primary forest. Cockpit country is a wilderness. It looks like a myriad of giant tortoise shells. As far as the eye can see, thousands of limestone hills worn smooth by time. This is Jamaica's last virgin territory. Millions of years of erosion have carved out this unique landscape populated by rare plant and animal species living side by side. Cockpit country has another name in the form of a Creole saying, Mi no sen you no come, a clear warning that strangers are not welcome. This is the entrance to Potu Hole. This cave has a special place in Adam's heart. Adam discovered this shaft with a friend one morning in 1994. The two cavers began exploring this previously unknown cave, a special moment in a man's life. 
Potuhol had a surprise in store for them, and Adam will never forget that day. Even today, he's one of the rare cavers to visit Potuhol. Its entrance is 30 meters below ground. sport but it's it's so rewarding you, you feel you're, you're at one with the earth you know it, it's a, a bonding takes place when my friend and I came back here to explore the cave we felt yes we are the first you know only to discover these magnificent drawings that have been here thousands of years before us. So we were not the first. And it was a very humbling feeling. We felt small, but, but at peace and, and, and in awe, you know? Um, a little scary too, <laughs> you know? Um, but it was a very emotional experience. My passion really started from reading books and, and, and seeing these wonderful pictures of, of caves around the world. Yeah, I must have been about 10. I read a little National Geographic magazine of a little boy in France who slid down a hole with the candles and discovered these beautiful carvings and, and, and pictures of bison and animals from back in the Ice Age. That story inspired me so much. I wanted to find my own. And ever since then, I've been um, exploring caves. Thanks to Potuhol, Adam's dream has come true. This is his underground lair, where he's directly connected with his own history. And this is what he discovered that first time. These drawings were done by the Taino Indians, the first inhabitants of Jamaica, thousands of years ago. When Columbus came here, he found them here. They were here living on the island. You couldn't help but think what life must have been like then, you know? What, what brought them down here to, what, what religious um, meaning do these drawings have? So it is, it is still open for interpretation, but I believe it's a religious site. I love the nature in Jamaica. It has so much to offer. You know, it's, it's pristine. It's beautiful. You really get to feel at peace when you're out in the, in the environment with nature. It's a very special place. I've been to other countries and other islands and I always want to come back home. And not just because I'm Jamaican, but the diverseness of the place. You can be 2,000 meters up, and then at sea level in a matter of an hour. So the sun, the sand, the sea, and the mountains and the rivers, everything is packed together in one little island.
In the Blue Mountains, the streams and torrents have only a few kilometers to go to reach the sea. This is where Swift River takes its source. Water and forest marry to open a path into a peaceful realm where time alone passes. Howard is the Swift River Rastaman. Here in this valley that looks like a sort of fantasy Eden is where he was born 40 years ago. The Rastafari culture carries the weight of slavery and the memory of the men and women torn from their African homeland. For we is African glory. Emperor Ile, Ile, King Selassie, I grow why? No need them to lie, them Babylon story. Yes, Rastafari, they see we are no no way. In the 1930s, Jamaican blacks turned their hopes to Africa. Haile Selassie had just been crowned emperor. King of kings, Selassie claimed to be the direct descendant of the biblical kings Solomon and David. For the Rastafarians, he was a living god. Conscious lyrics are with the pan they move. Yes, Rastafari, we know we I prove. Rastafari no got nothing to lose. No way. Rastafarianism is rooted in these valleys shrouded in clouds that are dispersed by the winds every night. Howard has been living in these mountains for 40 years. He lived for a while in Kingston, the capital, but he remembers that as a time of frustration. In the city, bullets fly, making shadows in the sky. Why keep walking the dusty streets when the forest can give you what you need? Living on the banks of the river, Howard has salvaged a part of his childhood happiness. Well, my first memory at the river is right here, where I'm sitting now. My mom sent me to full the water, and I see the raft, and I go on the raft, and I pitch off and wet up my clothes. So we go home, you know? And they say, what you drop? So oh, we went up rafting. <laughs> yes, sir, that's my youthful days. I remember at the riverside until now. Like when the river came down, it's like you hear a stream, like somebody playing music. You hear the stone go boom, boom, boom. Lots of kids afraid of it, but we don't afraid of it because we know what it's all about, because the river come heavy. And when the river come heavy, no one can cross over it. Neither the bird want to fly over it so easy because she is very terrible. Jamaica is a central place of the earth. Because we're surrounded by water. And this is like a ship. Jamaica is just like a ship to me because it, it, it's just a small island still, but it's very solid, you know? So I know say, it's a blessed place.
I was born in the hills. I'm just a part of nature. That's why I born in the hills. If I was not a part of nature, I would born in the hospital or somewhere, you understand? So I have to born where the nature is. So I love nature. So I communicate with nature, and nature communicates with me. Sometimes I sit down and I say, oh, I need something from the bush. I go and dig a piece of yam and cut a banana or a planting, yeah, and come and cook. And that's natural from nature. Howard, the Swift River Rastaman, has a very simple mystical relationship with the natural surroundings of his birthplace. In the Rastafari culture, the earth produces plants and food. It allows the tree of life to thrive and people to progress on a spiritual path. to catch fish, but there is no fish today. But I hope we catch some. The force of life and the spirits hover over Swift River. Howard respects the past and carries his destiny in his heart like an unshakable force. For three centuries, Jamaica prospered thanks to its sugarcane plantations, where tens of thousands of slaves toiled. The Blue Mountains, Howard's Mountains, were their refuge when the first slave revolts broke out. The slaves that escaped from the plantations were called maroons. They were perfectly at home in this steep, inhospitable terrain where white men dared not venture. The Maroons set up self-sufficient communities in the eastern part of Jamaica. They were fearsome, invisible warriors. The wars, which lasted over 150 years, would eventually free thousands of men and women from their shackles. At the end of the 18th century, there were 300,000 slaves in Jamaica. Almost nothing remains from that period. In the heart of the Blue Mountains, only the stories linger on. In the Swift River Valley, near Howard's place, there's a ruin lost in the forest. The villagers call it the slave's house. These people, they work so very hard to be what they want to be, you understand, and to survive. So they will do anything to create a house just to have their shelter and to get away from the certain trouble, because his trouble was all around, you understand? So they want to get away from certain trouble, so they bring themselves and hide themselves up here, you know? This evening, Howard is waiting for the darkness of an almost moonless night. Yeah, it's a good night for fishing because there is no rain and the sky are very blue, so beautiful. So, and the water is nice too, but it's a little bit chilly, but don't mind. From you go inside the water and you get warm and used to the water, you don't feel cold again.
Howard can pass entire nights wading up the streams that feed Swift River. He could name every corner of his valley. He's scouting for what nature has to offer. bamboo torch, he's on the lookout for the slightest movement in the water. He's looking for little glowing red dots, crayfish eyes. Howard never sells his catch. Like all Rastafarians, he takes only what he needs. Fishing means, above all, communion with the river. This is what gives meaning to his life. When you feel lonely and you want some company and there is no friends around, you can come to the river because you have lots of friends. Because you could hear the rolling of the river and the sound it's like a lots of friends talking, you understand? So if you go to the deeper part of the water, it's silent. But if you come to the where the stone is, it's like a lots of people. Because the water just rushing between the stones, you know, and making that beautiful sound. Free diving is not your ordinary sport. You have to dive and hold your breath for long moments. For Nakle, this is like playing a piece of music written in his soul. People always want what they don't have. They dream of exploring the ocean floor and breathing seawater instead of air. After a three minute dive at a depth of 30 meters, it's time to surface and come back to the world.
water is so important in our life that we can not live without. Whether it is to drink it or to enjoy it, whether in the sea or the river. And uh, I work all around the island, and when I get the chance to go in the water, I will. And sometimes I will come here just to be in the wild and listen to the river, just hearing and being in the water. It's just a relaxation for me, personally. When Naklay gets the urge to reconnect with the earth, all he has to do is leave the beach and head up this river. Water is his element, and it flows everywhere here in Jamaica. I feel very safe underwater more than on the road or in bed. Underwater, I feel like the safest. Although for certain people, it's something that is very dangerous. But to me, I feel very safe. That's why it's a need for me sometimes. It's a refuge. Like I will go, it's a refuge just to have your moment with nature and connect with it. At some point, all children wonder what's on the other side of the sea. Ever since the dawn of time, people have crisscrossed the ocean, searching for adventure and sometimes in hope of a better life. It was the chaos of war that brought Nakle to Jamaica about 10 years ago. He and his family had to flee their native land, Lebanon. He went to Europe first, then spent a few years in Canada before dropping anchor in Jamaica. The forests, the rivers, the people, the sea, he was captivated by it all. The Caribbean has given meaning to his life. Jamaica has given him a peaceful new life with the local fishermen and his musician friends. We're struggling to survive. Well, where my family means the world. So we fight to stay alive now. First you rock me to sleep. Like a From I'm very young, I was brought in uh, really in the sea. And my father used to take us to the sea and uh, we have learned so much from it. Uh, that is part of our life uh, now. Um, it's a passion for me. I don't think I can live anywhere far from the sea. Uh, I have traveled a lot and it's uh, part of my life, part of my passion, that, uh, uh, that is a need for me to go. For me, I have to concentrate into listening to what my body tells me. Everybody I go to the sea, it's an experience, a new experience. So I'm just looking forward to going in the water, but at the same time, I have to relax myself because it's a sport where you need to relax and you need to concentrate uh, on all, all, all your body because in the water, it's a different thing. It's very important that you have a connection with the water. 
you understand, you can feel the vibration of the water, listen to the wind, listen to the sea. Uh, it's, it's very important because to me it's a passion and the only way you feel comfortable in that environment is that you, you really relate to the water. When I dive, the whole experience starts from I set my mind into going to sea. And then when I'm in the water, it's a different world. Being in the water, it will reflect to me a little bit Mother Nature, just being in this water that is this liquid that actually holds holds you like 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 a mother will hold hold you and have the, her arms around you so uh, it's an experience that uh, that to me um, I cannot live without Sometimes I close my eyes. I am in sense of all, of everything that is happening around me. Just gliding through the water, diving down, looking at the, at the floor, at the sea floor, the fish. Everything, it kind of talks to me in a way that I'm looking and I'm seeing like traffic and a lot of things going on where people don't really realize such a life. And, and this feeling, it's fulfilling for me and this is what I'm always in search. Free diving is an inner voyage. Holding his breath for long periods allows him to leave the worries of the world behind. Baudelaire speaks of the alliance between man and sea. Man, no one has sounded the depths of your being. O oh, sea, no person knows your most hidden riches. How strange the secrets you preserve so jealously. Diving is a rendezvous with solitude. Here the sky and sea stretch to infinity, which gives a different perspective of the world around us. They both attract people with a thirst for adventure, and the absolute. For Naclay, the sea is a strict taskmaster who doesn't tolerate complacency. He knows that it's not easy to come to terms with it. Naclay is a child of Lebanon uprooted by war. In Jamaica, he has made a new life for himself through his encounters with nature. The sea still nourishes him as on the day he was born. He draws his life-sustaining force from it. Jamaican fishermen are among the Caribbean's poorest. Not far from Kingston, there are even fishermen who take to the sea without a boat.
Bart is two miles out at sea. He's been letting himself drift since daybreak. Nakle often meets him when he's out diving. Hey, Nakle, how are you doing? How are you doing, buddy? Not too bad. So what are you doing now? I caught two fish. Catching two fish. <laughs> so you're using your fins to balance yourself? Yeah, in, in, yes, it's my engine. engine. That's, the, <laughs> that's the engine. <laughs> Before going out, I checked the weather report on the television. If it's good, I come out. If it's too bad, I don't come. I don't have a life jacket. A boat dropped me off. It'll be back this evening. There are two of us. We watch out for each other. If there's a problem, we help each other out. Nakle's passion for the sea has also given him a vocation. For five years now, he's been working for a humanitarian organization that finances the construction of fishing boats for the island's poorest fishermen. For him, it's a way of giving back to others what the sea has given to him. When you start to work with the fishermen, you actually start to uh, come close to them, to the family, to the community, and you start to integrate yourself, and they start to look on you differently and listen to you and learn from you. And you learn from them a lot and the lifestyle that they have, because the most important part that we're doing is actually improving their livelihood through fishing, sustainable fishing. It's very emotional to me because I love the sea and I love the people and we're trying to make the two of them work uh, in, a, in a way that two of them can survive. For, and, and have a better future. Nakle, with his organization, has been working with 17 fishing villages. They have financed the construction of 78 boats, quite a little fleet. If you can see the yellow and blue boats, those are part of the project of Food for the Poor. Uh, we come here and give them training in, in sustainable fishing to improve their livelihood. And part of the project also, we installed a solar light, as you can see, this light. So they have solar system here. In the night, they have lights before they go to sea or when they're coming to sea uh, at night. Nakle and the Jamaican fishermen have a common mission, fishing with respect for the environment and humankind, a vital issue for all the island's inhabitants. Used to be was a place full of love and harmony, and I pray that it'll come back to town, John. No, no more bullets fly, making shadows in the sky tonight in Kingston Town.